coming from, your drinking water or, what, or wherever it's coming from, to your body, it's the same thing. I found that fluoride is at the hazardous waste sites, the EPA's national priorities list. Yes, it's a pesticide, as mentioned before. And then I found that fluoride is used to process uranium, and it is used to produce atomic energy. And so this really concerned me because I didn't realize, coming from a dental institution, I thought that fluoride was only coming from drinking water. I really didn't realize that when I drank a Coke, when I drank Snapple tea, when I drank grape juice, that I was really adding to my body burden of uh, fluoride with all these others. So I thought this was important enough to submit another grant in 96. And the information, they were still a little scared about this, and they said, gee, there doesn't seem to be a link between the brain or bone problems. I don't see how this could be possible. And then in walked Cliff Honecker into my life, and he walked, and he says, he asked me two questions. I'd never met or heard from this before. He knocked on my door in this, this summer, as a matter of fact, in 1996, and he asked two questions. He asked me about my CNS work, and he asked me about my relationship to Harold Hodge. Remember, Hodge was one of the people in my department of toxicology I'd worked with, and he, would work. he was a chief pharmacologist on the Manhattan Project. This man had never said anything to me in all that time. He asked me lots of questions about what we were doing, but he never actually said what was going on. Cliff showed me some documents then from the Manhattan Project that had recently been declassified. I then got a publication from 1949 where this man had been there when they actually started working with the fluoride and did the original toxicology studies. And they described what happened to some of these people when they were accidentally overexposed to fluoride. And here is what he found. All the seriously injured individuals were unusually nervous apprehensive for 45 days after the accident. One individual was definitely overstimulated for about three days, exaggerating all facial expressions and being unusually verbose and talkative. At times he was almost incoherent. The other seriously injured patient, although normally quiet and placid, became very apprehensive with a similar tendency toward the exaggeration of statements. The opinion of all observers held that the mental reactions were more than could possibly be explained on a fear reaction basis. The second accident that they had, the mental status for the first five or six days following the accident was marked by general sluggishness, the couch potato syndrome, with transient, transient periods of restlessness, irascibility, and nervous tension with occasional silliness and loss of contact. Does that sound like anybody you know? Dr. Hodge in 1965 wrote another book. This time, though, in that book, all he talked about were the effects of fluoride on bone and teeth. He did not talk about uh, anything about these CNS effects. But then Cliff showed me some documents from 1944. And in this memo, I just want to point out a couple of statements. This memo was marked top se or secret. And no one knew this, but it, and it's dated April of 1944, and I can't hardly read it from here, but it says, it's to Stafford Warren, who was part of the um, uh, head of, of the project, and they talk about here that there is clinical evidence to suggest that C616, that's uranium hexafluoride, may have a rather marked central nervous system effect with mental confusion, drowsiness and lassitude as the conspicuous features. It seems most likely that the fluoride component, rather than the uranium, is the causative factor. They knew in 1944 that it was causing a problem. They go on to say here that it's causing a problem and we are worried about it and we want to do animal experimentation because these, um, we're, we're afraid that our workers are going to become confused and they're not going to be able to handle working with this stuff. They're going to be a danger to themselves and they're going to be a danger to others. The memo goes on. They set up a budget. They gave money to these people to do the studies in rats that I just did in 1996. They had the budget. It was approved. The Colonel in the Manhattan Project said, yes, go ahead and do it. This, this office approves that these, this experimental program can go forward. 
Not six months later, another memo comes in and it says, if you started those studies on the mental condition in rats, stop them. And if you haven't started them, don't start them at all. So they knew there was a problem, they stopped it back 50 years ago, and they never did the study, and the studies were never reintroduced into the documents. And you don't see that in the literature today, and that's why you don't see a lot of the dentist who knows the problems with the CNX. Now, going on, since then I've gone to other, liter other literature around the world, and I can tell you in, in a nutshell, you've mentioned the IQ problems, You've mentioned, I can tell you, that uh, there's a review that's recently written, as, as recent as 1994, that says the syndrome that you have if you're exposed looks a lot like the chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I can go back to the 1950s where these people, uh, they talk about their memory loss, they talk about the problems with coordinating their thoughts. These are documented and they do exist, but you can't find them in the literature in the United States. I had to go outside. I had to wait until someone knocked on my door and showed me declassified documents that these problems were known about some time ago. Then I have to go on, uh, I see I'm, I'm a little too slow, but one of the last documents I saw that just blew me away and I said, if I do nothing else, I've got to get out so that the people do have the right to know this. They went out, they had one big accident or a lot of release of the fluoride. The chief pharmacologist, Harold Hodge, that I worked with, went out and he write, writes a memo about his visit to the site. And he says, there's no question it's hydrogen fluoride. There's no question that uh, the people are sick. There's no question that the fruit is poisoned. There's no question that the, the levels were so high that there had to be an em agricultural embargo on the fruit, which was stopped. There was no question that people were being poisoned. And then he turns around and says, should we try and alleviate the fear of the public about fluoride by telling them it's good for their teeth? So the next time someone comes up and says to you that fluoride is good for your teeth, if I were you, I would just say no. Thank you. Dr. Mullinex. Proponents of fluoridation were invited to speak at this Clark University forum so that Wooster citizens could make an informed choice of whether to fluoridate their community. Following a 40-year-old policy of not appearing with opponents of fluoridation where detailed questions of safety and effectiveness are to be addressed, promoters of fluoridation refused to attend, electing instead to rely on statements of denial that any question of harmfulness exists and impugning the character of anyone who presents facts to the contrary. Unfortunately, the general population is highly susceptible to million-dollar sound bites touting the unsubstantiated merits. Ask your public access station to repeat this tape so that others can be informed. An extended version of this tape is also available for VCR viewing, which includes a question and answer segment from this forum. Please assist Citizens for Safe Drinking Water and other organizations around the nation to stop this deadly practice of poisoning our water supply. In California, another 25 million people will suffer from fluoridation unless we act now. Thursdays on the Edge. And you say that the battle is over And you say that the war is all done Go tell it to those with the wind in their nose Who run from the sound of the guns 